All right, let's open up our Bibles, picking up in our study, going through the book of Samuel. Can we pray too much? Okay, then stand to your feet. Come on. Yep, go ahead. There you go. Take the hand of the person next to you. If you can. All right. Father God, we want to thank you for the blessed saint, our seeker, that we're holding hands with right now. We pray, God, that you would touch them tonight. We know that you love them more than they can possibly imagine. So we believe, Lord, as we hold their hand, more importantly, God, you are, and that you have plans to speak to the deepest part of their soul tonight, God. So we pray, Lord, clarity of vision and 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 an ear to hear what the Spirit would say to them. Father, we pray as your bride, as one body in this place, and we ask, Jesus, that you would come and speak to your flock. We need to hear your voice, Lord. Your voice is the only one we want to hear. So God, may you uh, protect us, Lord, even in... Our, our fears and, and our biases, Lord, that would block us from getting marching orders from you tonight. Father, may you show yourself powerful and faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, last time we were in the book of Samuel... 1 Samuel chapter 6, we saw that the people of God were going through hardship and, if you would, warfare. They had lost the Ark of the Covenant. The Philistines had taken it away, and the Philistines were sorry that they did that. Whenever you try to be at odds with God, you will every time regret that. It's one of those Why did I bang my head into a wall? Well, God was doing a work, no doubt, in the life of his people by allowing the Ark of the Covenant, representing his very presence, to be removed. God will allow that. He will not only allow, well, like the church of Ephesus, his lampstand to be removed for a purpose. We know with them it was that they might repent in return to the first love. But he he takes away not only his presence or blessing would be a better way to put it, he'll also allow your enemies to conquer you. It happens. You gotta look at the big picture. It's not about a particular battle. The war is won. Death has no sting. But, But we do go through times in our walk with the Lord and our sanctification where, man, we just we find that we've been trying to do things our own way and it's given way for God to have to say, I'm gonna have to pull my blessing or remove my lampstand. I'm gonna have to allow persecution and hardship. It's kind of like someone going, I'm not going to pay my taxes. It's unconstitutional. I knew a guy who did this. I'm not gonna pay them. And then he got thrown in jail by the IRS. Boneheaded move. And so God allowed the IRS to throw him in jail. Why? (laughs) He gave real estate for that authority to come and do that. And many times in the lives of people in the church, we want to do things our own way or add on to what God is doing in our life, and then God has no choice but to say, I chasten and discipline those that I love. How does he do that? God, where are you? You ever felt that? I'm just, I'm I'm lacking peace and joy in my life, and you tell me I should always have peace and joy, and I don't. What's going on here? Man, it just seems like I'm being persecuted and have so many enemies and bad raps and, 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 and spiritual warfare. Does God allow demonic opposition to take place in the life of his people? Oh, you bet. You bet. I mean, he allowed, talk about demonic opposition and even possession with Judas. That was all part of God's sovereign picture to bring the Redeemer on the cross that you might sit here today and go, Jesus, I love you. I mean, our God is sovereign. He uses everything and anything, anytime for his purpose. He is a big God, amen? 
in the lives of his people as we're learning, as we're walking this journey, if you would, to our promised land, heaven, to see Jesus face to face, we go through times where we think we can add on to what God has done or take away from what God has done to try and do our own thing. And that opens the door for, again, the disciplining hand of God lampstand removal, and also persecution from enemies, whether they're human enemies and spiritual enemies. We'll see tonight pictures in the word of God that when you defy God's direction for your life, you basically open up real estate. It's almost like saying, talking to a demon and saying, I want to serve you up a steak dinner in my life. I want to actually invite a demonic presence to come sit inside my dining room and I want to feed him. Now you might say, Dave, you're implying that Christians can be demon-possessed. No, a demon can never put his name on the deed to your house, if you would, your soul, because you're born again, okay? So please don't worry that I'm trying to teach demons can get demon-possessed. And you know, I'm just trying to say that there can be a bewitching as the Apostle Paul puts it, an oppression that takes place. And the only reason it happens is because you give legal access for that to take place. Let's take a look and see what we can learn tonight concerning how to deal with the enemies of God. 1 Samuel chapter 7, it says, Then the men of kiroth Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill, and consecrated Eleazar, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was that the ark remained in kirjath Jerem a long time. It was there 20 years. We'll read further on. It was actually there longer than that. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If, if you return to the Lord with all your heart, and then put away the foreign gods and the ashtoreths from among you. You and prepare your hearts to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Stop there. What a message. They have defied God, and they begin to add in worship of Baal and the ashtoreth poles. Basically, Ashtoreth was that goddess that was of multiple breasts and accentuated parts of her body that, that men would look at, and they have the Ashtoreth poles, and it would be kind of a, 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 a sexual type of, of worship that would take place. And they, and they actually added this on to their worship of God. When it says that he's calling them to return to the Lord, it's not so much that they had left the ways of the Lord, but they added on to the ways of the Lord. In other words, we believe that Jehovah is God, but we also have, want to have a little bail on the side, a little asterisk pole on the side. That's what got them in trouble when they found themselves in defeat with the Philistines, ultimately the ark being removed. Wow, how humiliating, right? Going, being a people that God has delivered from Egypt and Pharaoh and, and, and powerful miracles of the Red Sea and and. Man, incredible things have taken place. Of course, Jericho, these guys have a reputation, the nation of Israel, and now they're complete and utterly humiliated. Why did they get there? They got there because they tried to say, God, we want you, but we also want the world. Now, he says to them, through the prophet Sam, who happens to be the last judge, for we enter the era of the kings, beginning with King Saul. He says, God here, a powerful promise here in the last part of verse 3, he says that God will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. In other words, you're under their oppression. Basically, you've been defeated by them, and I'm going to deliver them. I'm going to take away their area of real estate and oppression in your life if you'll do this. In other words, there's a condition on victory that we have. See, many people think that, man, my problems in my life, you know, what's going on here is, is I, I need deliverance from a demon. I need to go to a deliverance ministry, and I need to get someone with a bucket of olive oil and dump it on my head and pray in tongues over me for an hour, and that way I'll be free from every demon. And, and I know I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I'm just saying it, it turns to where people are actually looking to other people more than the Lord. And so if, if you want to know, man, how can I have victory over my enemies? And please 
make no mistake about it, you have enemies. As soon as you declared yourself a son or daughter of the Most High God, you declared war against hell. You think hell just set back with a popcorn machine, oh, that's great, another born-again Christian. No, you know, I mean, just like you have angels that are set to protect you, we read about. I have no doubt, looking at Ephesians 6, there's a certain hierarchy in hell and a delegation of different ranks and powers and principalities and sold privates and all this. No doubt you have a certain part of hell that's delegated to give you a rough time. Okay? And, and, and the thing is, they have only the authority in your life that you give them. Do you understand that? I mean, because greater he who's in you than he's in the world. So if that's true, and we have the divine nature of God living within us, and we have power and authority in the name or the character of Jesus, as that character is walked out in our walk, that is, it's not just a special speech or a tag word or name that we say. You know, that's like the seven sons of Sceva. You know, let me tell you what, it's more than just saying it. When the character bleeds through your life, demons are like gremlins. Bite, light, bite, light. They don't want anything to do with you. Okay. But when you defy God's plan for your life and the lampstand is removed and there's a darkness there, demonic presence feels at home. What can we do? What does a person do if, if, if you're having difficulties with God's enemies that are now your enemies? There's a lot of lessons here in this chapter and the first one I can think about, and I want you to write this down. Love, mercy. hey, well, how is that going to help me with enemies? I mean, don't I need to learn to pray in the Spirit and learn how to pray certain ways, certain warfare prayers and warfare scriptures? I want you to understand that the enemies of God, um, well, we see a picture of them symbolically of the Philistines there. And chapter 6, when Ty went through that, there was some talk about powerful principles for spiritual warfare. We watched them having, the enemies of God having this ark, and at one point, when they were going to return the ark, they decided they were going to open up the ark, right? They were going to open up the ark to put pieces of gold in there. Now, if you missed the study in chapter 6, interesting, kind of, I have, to, I have to backtrack on this. What they did is they found themselves inflicted, the King James Version puts it, with hemorrhoids. Funny chapter. Hemorrhoids and rats. And so what the five kings decided to do was to make five golden hemorrhoids, whatever that's going to look like, <laughs> and five golden rats and put it inside the Ark of the Covenant as a type of penance for their sin. Talk about weird, right? I love the Bible. Cracks me up and convicts me, all that. And so... Here, they open this up, and 50,000 of them die. That's a rough day. That's a good way for the enemies of God to be wiped out, right? But what's interesting is the principle that's there. You can look at all that and go, wow, that's incredible. But I want you to think about this. The beauty of the message of the Ark of the Covenant is the presence of God was found on the mercy seat. Inside was the law. They're going to make sure that the law and the budded staff is still in there. And so now they're going to check out, see if the law was there. But there's something they had to do before they did that. They had to remove the mercy seat. Whenever you look, try to look at God's law and you want to remove mercy, you're in for problems. If you want to know how to overcome the enemies of God, the first thing, well, he has already shown you, oh, man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Huh? Yeah. Focus on that moment to love mercy. If you want to walk in a freedom from God's enemies, then you have to be a person who says, you know what, God, I am going to just run into your presence knowing there is Grace and mercy to help me in my time of need. See, usually I find the people that are afflicted by, whether it's demonic presence, strongholds, just walking a roller coaster in their life, I find them very judgmental. They're the type of people that, that sin sniff all over the church. They love to point the finger at other people, gossip, slander. Uh, 
it's just usually a companionship with those that are walking in defeat and walking basically in fellowship with the enemies of God and in compromise. They're usually people that love the law without mercy. So more importantly than going to a deliverance ministry is you probably need to repent of legalism. You need to realize that you're not walking and you're not loving mercy. See, someone who loves mercy, you can't condemn or judge people. You can't. It doesn't work together. And I find people constantly, I need deliverance. I need prayer. I need to fast. That's what, Fasting is the answer. Fasting is a good thing. Jesus said certain demons and, and enemies you don't overcome without prayer and fasting. Good spiritual principle in the word. But I don't look at that as first space. The first space is, God, I want to get back to the gospel of Jesus Christ because usually that's the problem. Usually that's it. Not that I didn't learn enough about spiritual gifts, spiritual warfare, all that. No, no, no. It's usually that I've lost view of mercy because I took off the mercy seat, and I'm trying to view God who he is through law, and I'm a wreck. I'm a mess. Place stinks up of rats. I've got hemorrhoids. I'm miserable. Okay? <laughs> that's just like they were. And, and check it out. Once you do that, this is, this is what's beautiful here. Once you really repent of, of, of the legalism, all of a sudden, you start looking at the things that, st- that Samuel told me need to repent of. I mean, look at some of these things. He goes, I want you to put away your foreign gods and the asterisk bowl, certain sexual sins, and, and you're adding on to things in your life as a believer to satisfy you outside of things God has given you. See, many times we have a difficulty repenting of compromise in our life because we haven't loved mercy. Have you ever found yourself worshiping foreign gods? You ever found yourself holding the Bible with one hand and reaching for their asterisk pole with the other? And yet, this shame comes on you where you find it difficult to come to God and, and find the power to walk in victory. Why? Because you're still under law. How many of you find yourselves going, man, I, I, I've, I've fallen in that area so many times. I don't know what to do anymore. I feel so oppressed. I feel like such a loser, such a hypocrite. I love God, and he knows I love him, and I do love him, but I'm so inconsistent in my walk. I'm not joyful always, and I don't have the peace of God guarding my steps and and, and bringing me understanding. It's because you've taken your eyes off the mercy of God. Here's the good news. Because of the cross, you don't get what you deserve. There it is. That's mercy. You deserve hell, you get heaven. After he saved you, like Peter, you've denied him, and yet he approached Peter, he approaches you. Don't you love mercy? I mean, for real. And I am convinced so many people that struggle with habitual sin, demonic oppression, all these things going on, if they would just go back to the cross and say, Lord, I took the mercy seat off, and I'm looking at your law, and I'm looking at you through law, and I've got disease and depression, and and, and relationships are falling apart, and it, ow, I'm a Pharisee. That's what happened. Once you love mercy you won't feel like such a fool confessing your sin of idol worship, of sexual worship and idolatry. You'll go, I can come into your presence with boldness even though I've got mud from the world all over me again and again and again. But Lord, your mercy, it knows no end. It endures forever. Now that's probably not the message you think you were gonna hear about spiritual warfare. But I am telling you, there's lots of people, they're praying, they're fasting, they're misery in Scripture, they're going to deliverance services, they're doing all this, and they're banging their head against the wall. If they just get on their knees and look to the cross and love his mercy and get freed from this legalistic binding possession that's in their life, they would have found themselves like this weight being fall off. They'd be like, oh my gosh, I don't feel so ashamed about my sin. I'm convicted over it, but I don't feel any shame over it. There's a difference. I'm convicted, it's wrong, and I repent, I turn, I confess it's of God, but it has nothing to do with who I am. 
who I am as a blood-bought saint of the Most High God, and that's because of his mercy, that's who I am. So I will sin, but I'll get, I'll get convicted, but I'm not going to walk in shame, because shame breeds legalism and breeds habitual sin and hypocrisy. We've got enough of that in the church today, right? So when you look at this scripture here, it's like, man, so think of the picture here. Samuel's saying, you guys, you need to repent and turn of all this stuff and stop adding on to the things God has given you And then God will deliver you from your enemies. And meanwhile, they're looking at an Ark of a Covenant that's been brought back that their enemies had problems because they tried to look at God without the mercy seat. He's saying, no, look at the mercy seat. And you'll feel a boldness to come in the presence of God no matter how many times you've blown it. How beautiful is that? The Lord wants to deliver us. I mean, in reality, positionally, he already has. He said on the cross, it's finished. Okay, it's already a done deal. But practically, in our sanctification, working out our salvation, we're learning what mercy and grace is all about. And sometimes we learn it, and then we forget it, right? That's why he said, do this remembrance of me, because he knows we get spiritual amnesia and we forget. He's like, no problem, I'll remind you. You need a reminder. It's kind of like you get your license. You have to go to continued education because you forget stuff, right? The Lord knows how we're made. He knows our frame. And he's like, I don't mind reminding you about my mercy and grace for eternity. Oh, hallelujah. Verse 4, so the children of Israel put away the bales and the ashbals and served the Lord only. Look what they did, guys. They repented. In other words, it wasn't a matter of just going, wow, we're really bummed out. We've been in defeat of our enemies. But God has made a covenant with us. He said, if we'll stop adding on to the things to make us happy and satisfy us in our life and say, Jesus, you're enough. What you've done is enough. Your mercy and the blood in the mercy seat that makes us available to come into your presence, that's enough. You say, if we'll believe that, then you'll deliver us from our enemies. I'll shake on that one, Lord. And they turned. How fast do you think you get delivered? Like that. Like a light switch, man. These people, they took God at his word. I found in my walk with the Lord, when I take him at his word, he always keeps his word. Verse 5, and Samuel said, Gather all of Israel to Mitzbah, which Mitzbah means watchtower. So he, he gathers all Israel, all those that have wrestled with the Lord, to go to the watchtower, and I will pray to the Lord for you. Guys, I want you to know of an incredible verse that I love. You might know it here, James 5. It says that if you confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another, you may be healed. The affectionate, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Here, a a powerfully righteous man now is going to pray for them. When Samuel was a judge, it wasn't for condemnation. It was for deliverance. So here this man of God says, hey, we're not going to stick our head in the dirt. We're going to go to mitzvah. We're going to open our eyes. We're going to stand in the watchtower, and we're going to get prayed over by this righteous man. It says, so they gathered together to mitzvah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel judged the children of Israel. I guys want you to listen to this psalm here. Psalm 6 says, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled, my soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, and deliver me. O save me for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you, in the grave You will not give you thanks. I I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch in tears. My eyes waste away because of grief. It's old because of my enemies. The psalmist is very clear. God, I know that sin brings problems and conflict in our relationship. And and it brings about basically an opportunity for my enemies to afflict me. But God, if you don't forgive me, I can't give you praise and shield and hell. So God, only because of your mercy am I going to find healing and deliverance. Even in the Old Testament, God under, they understood the nature of God, that God is a God of mercy. All through the Psalms, his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever. 
They knew the character of God. Lamentations, the prophet Jeremiah, listen to this here in chapter three. Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled. You have not pardoned. You have covered yourself with anger and pursued us. You have slain and not pitted. You have covered yourself with a cloud that prayer should not pass through. You have made us an offscouring and refuse in the midst of the peoples. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. And yet the verse I quoted earlier, Micah 6, 8, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Guys, listen closely. We see throughout the scripture a common thread. This common thread is that when we take our eyes off the goodness of God, it opens up the door for the enemy to come in and have rights in our life. It's, it's the way, I mean, even in Joshua, listen to this, this verse here. Joshua chapter seven, it says, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they had become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed things from among you. Even here in Joshua, when they crossed over the, the promised land, there was this principle going on, man, I love you, you're my people, I've called you, I've chosen you, I've delivered you, I brought you over in this glorious land of milk and honey, but because you're loving foreign gods and secular philosophies and things of the flesh, uh, check it out. Because of that, you're bringing about oppression and destruction upon yourself. Nothing new under the sun. This principle, this thread we see out right up to the book of Revelation, okay? And it's very clear. What has to take place is we have to go, I can't deliver myself. I can't. I have no power of myself to overcome sin. That's why I needed a savior, okay? The only reason I'm trying is because I'm trying to look at the character and the power and the, and the blessing of God outside of the mercy of God. Here we see the people of God, they utterly had an utter failure, just like all these other people we read about in the, in the scripture. And finally they go, you know what? We're gonna put our eyes on the mercy of God and that makes us come to a place where we go, we can say anything to you, God. You love us in spite of us. Don't you love that truth? God, you love me in spite of me. And no matter how many times I brought a prostitute into the most holy place, right? No many times, how many times I've went there and cursed you in your face, Lord, or spit in your face, or put a crown of thorns on your head. No matter how many times I struck you and looked at you and knew what I was doing, you still will have mercy upon me if I come to you looking at who you are, who you say you are, and what you did for me. I'm telling you, and when you really see that, you, find, you go, why was I messing around with that thing of the flesh? Why was I doing that? Oh my gosh, what did Peter, I, I can just imagine what it was like after he denied the Lord and Jesus comes up and says, Peter, do you love me? Now for me, I would have been hiding my face in shame. I can't even look at you, Lord. You ever been there? You know what rescues you at that moment of condemnation? Mercy. Romans 12, in view of the mercies of God. Oh, I urge you, I shout at you, offer yourself. It's okay to come into his presence. He's not going to condemn you. He's not going to scream at you. He's not going to reject you. He's not going to smack you upside the head. I don't care who's abused you, used you, abandoned you. God is not like that. He's a perfect dad, Okay? perfect father and no matter how many times you've blown it and denied him and slayed your brother with slander or watched porn or cheated on your spouse or lied or kicked your dog or whatever you've done okay that you feel man i just i can't talk to god you start viewing the mercy you took the mercy seat off you're trying to be a christian without mercy you're a goofball <laughs> stop Oh my gosh. Verse seven, now when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together to Mitzpah, the lords of the Philistines, those five kings that we talked about, went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Now, here we go. Now they're getting a spirit of fear about them. 
Because, and, and many times that's what happens. We find ourselves in defeat, sin, hypocrisy. We repent. We start to find some relief. And then God allows persecution to come back again, right? He says you're going to be a sheep among wolves, right? He allows us to be rejected, cursed, all because it's kind of like, it's kind of like a trainer going, well, you, you went to 150, that's great. You got the cover. Well, now we're going to push to 170 and you'll be sore all over again. We're not going to be stuck here. We're pressing in for more. How does the Lord do it? Because he allows demonic oppression, hypocrites in the church, things of the world, laws being changed, governments falling apart, everything to shake because judgment begins with the house of God just to help us to go further, right? And, and many times when that happens, it says here, they were afraid, right? Psalm 64 says, Hear my voice, O God, in my meditation. Preserve my life from the fear of the enemy. Man, God does in our growing and becoming more like Jesus allows us. It's kind of like a father saying, hey, I, I got you riding the bicycle and this training wheels off, but it's time to take them off. But daddy, I'm going to be scared. I know. But that's part of your growth. That's part of your development of your equilibrium where you can kind of balance yourself, right? And, and stand and ride and go straight. I know you're afraid, but that's part of growing up. And so even if you found deliverance, man, sometimes that fear comes upon you. But that's the time to cry out to God and say, God, you have not given me a spirit of fear. I reject that in Jesus' name. I, you're a lot bigger than the Philistines. You're a lot bigger than the IRS. You're a lot bigger than this sickness. You're a lot bigger than the hypocrisy that's become an epidemic in the church. You're bigger, and God, you're going to deliver us from this. God is bigger. So whatever you're afraid of, God is allowing you to face that moment because he wants you to press in. He hasn't abandoned you. That's sometimes we think, oh, I'm afraid and things aren't going right. Is, did I do something wrong? No, God's taking the training wheels off. Maybe he's helping you grow a little bit. That's a good thing, right? Right, right on. Verse 8, check this out. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us and that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb, and offered it to a whole burnt offering of the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord of Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to the battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. Hallelujah. God thundered. Baal, the son of Dagon, supposedly, this pagan god, was called the god of thunder. So here we have a people repenting of worshiping the god of thunder, and here they're following after the Lord and perceiving something very special. We'll come back to it in a moment. It says that God comes and fights their enemies with thunder, shakes their world up. What took place that brought this incredible victory? It was the shedding of the blood of the Lamb. Oh, man, you guys know this verse all too well. Revelation 12, 11, it says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. Glory. How do I overcome the enemy? When God takes the training wheels off and I get a spirit of fear that things are not working out right and I'm confused what's going on, what do I do? I go back and remember I've got to love mercy. The cross, it's the blood. Jesus paid the price. Death has no sting. Death was the final enemy. And God conquered it by the shedding of the blood of the lamb. And when I cry out on that, God will go before me like a pillar of fire, okay? And he will overcome the enemy. I can't do it. I can't beat up Satan. I don't need to. He's already got his head all beat up, right? Right by, he stunk right by my Savior, Jesus Christ. He crushed him. See, that, that is the key when you hear people go, what does that mean, man, that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb? In other words, the judgment that should have came upon us came upon him. And because of that, the enemy has no legal rights in our lives. Unless, of course, you grab a hole in Astroth pole or worship Baal or worship your car or worship your job or you take, build some idol 
then you're giving the enemy, the Philistines, are those entities from the second heaven, legal access to give you a rough time. Boy, spiritual warfare sounds a little bit more clear-cut than what some people write books about. It is. It is. Sometimes people get so sensational, they want to mix together a cross with a Stephen King story and go, this is what you do. I'm telling you, you're taking your eyes off the cross and what the blood has done and the character and the heart of Abba Father has been misrepresented to you, so now you're trying to fight it on your own. And the battle belongs to the Lord, family. It doesn't belong to us. The enemy wants us to wage war. He did it. I'm in agreement. Yeah, I'm in agreement with what he did. Oh, man, my dad is big. He's got, he's, he takes care of me. Amen? Oh, verse 11. And then the men of Israel went up the mitzvah and pursued the, oh, I love this, pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as below Beth Car, which means Beth Car, this city means house of the lamb. I like that. It says not only did we, ha- did we walk in defeat because of the blood that was shed by the man of God, we have defeat because the voice of the Lord thundered and removed our enemies. Not only now do we recognize they have no authority and powers, we're going to pursue them and beat them to death. Not only in our sanctification do we recognize that we walk in, in victory. We don't fight from it. We fight for it. We fight from it. It's a done deal. It's a finished work. But check it out. In our minds, there's strongholds that we go on, that go inside our thoughts that we have to pursue. We have to chase after them, okay? It's, it's not as easy as you just go, well, okay, from what you're telling me, Dave, that because of the shed blood, I've won the victory. It's done. Death has no sting. I don't need to worry about demons, We don't need to talk about spiritual warfare and demonic presence and oppression and all those things. And there's some churches that do that. you got the extremes of some churches you never hear about hell or demons or principalities at all. And in some ministries, it seems like that's all they talk about, right? Goofy, goofy. What we do is we go, the battle's won. But the Lord has given us authority to cast down every thought that sets itself captive against Jesus. We we have authority to break down strongholds. It's called soul work. It's called sanctification. In other words, you know, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to read my Bible. And and I'm going to read through stories in the Bible. And I'm going to go, oh, wow, that's really cool. I I see here where, Lord, you you forgave the woman at the well. You, You forgave her for her sin, and, and that's so merciful, Lord. And, and, and you're just sitting around, and you're reading that story, and, and you're being touched by it. And then all of a sudden, it kind of comes to your mind, all those men that abused her and used her, took advantage of her, all the people that in their self-righteousness rejected her there at the well and condemned her. And all of a sudden, as you're reading, some thoughts come into your mind, you start to go, yeah, I remember when I was abused. I remember when I was rejected and slandered. I remember when I was abandoned. And all of a sudden, these thoughts start to come in your mind, and some hurt starts to to well up. Fear starts to come. Don't run from that. You know what you're supposed to do at that moment? You're supposed to pursue the Philistines. You're supposed to run after that. Yes, Lord, I remember that person, and I thank you, God, that your blood is sufficient not only for my sin, but those who, that person who sinned against me, you've forgiven them. You paid the price for the sin. I forgive them, and I release that. And that thought of judgment that's contrary to the grace you showed me, I cast that down in Jesus' name. You see? We are to be daily doing that. That's pursuing the Philistines. That's breaking down strongholds. We should be doing that all the time. All the time. That's, you want to talk about spiritual warfare 101. It's, 101. it's not learning how to exercise a demon out of somebody. It's learning how to break down strongholds in your life. If you're taking notes, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5, it says very clearly you know, that the weapons we have to wage war with are not carnal. They're not fleshly. They're spiritual. And they're all based, based in the blood. Yeah? You agree? Good. I'm glad you agree. Going back to Samuel, we'll go ahead and finish that out. For some reason, I lost my place here. There we go. Oh, man, verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mitzpah and Shin and called it Ebenezer, which means the stone of help. Boy, talk about the imagery in here, huh? 
Thus far, the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more in the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Then the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel. From Ekron to Gath, and Israel recovered its territories from the hands of the Philistines. Also, there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Check it out, guys, before we close out this chapter. So beautiful. Here we see, man, that now that they've got their eyes on the mercy, the true character of God, and, and, and they've turned from anything else except for what God has for them, put their eyes that it was that the judgment of God has passed them because of the blood, the Lord is doing the work. You know, Jesus is very clear. You know, I, I've given you just a really light yoke, easy burden. I've given you a walk with me where I've done the work. You know, and, and so we don't need to be striving against our enemies and persecution and spiritual warfare. The Lord says, I want to show you how big I am as a dad. If you just go back to looking at who I am. And he was doing this in the Old Testament. Here we have a picture of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. We have him saying, hey, I'm mitzvah. I'm the rock that delivers you. I mean, who says Jesus is not in the Old Testament? What Bible are you reading, Right? It's, it's, it's awesome. Verse, verse 15, and Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, meaning he delivered, brought deliverance to them. And he went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, to Gilgal, and Mitzpah, and judged Israel in all those places. But he always returned to Ramah, for his home was there. There he judged Israel, and he built an altar to the Lord. Check this out, guys. We'll close with this thought. People want to go, Man, I want to walk victorious. I want to, I want to live Ephesians 6 with the armor of God. I, I want to live the, this power that, that, that Jesus told Matthew about, uh, that he told Peter about in Matthew 16, that through the confession of Christ, we have power to bind and to, to loose, to call what's darkness and what's called light, to have power and authority. I want to walk in all this, so what do I do? We're kind of going backwards here, but I want you to take note of that this man of God, his priority, in the midst of being the circuit preacher, he was a busy guy. He's going to Bethel, Gilgal, right? he's all over the place. But back at his house, his priority was to have his home as a place of worship. I know some Christians that are big on ministry, and they, they have a deliverance ministry, a prayer ministry. They have you know, a, a feeding ministry, and they do all these things, and they, and they claim they walk in victory over the enemy. I'm telling you, you can be doing all those things, but if you don't have an altar in your house, if you can't say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay? I am loving my spouse. I'm honoring my spouse. I'm working through things with my spouse. I'm disciplining my children, and I'm not being an Eli that we read about, that spineless father, right? I'm not being like him. I, as for me and my house, we're going to sell the Lord, and this will be a place of worship. Let me tell you what. If you're not doing that, you are giving the enemy real estate in your life. It starts there. More important than what ministries you think you're doing for God, he doesn't need you to do anything for him, by the way, okay? He's got it all covered. You get to be involved in ministry. He doesn't need you. He just loves you and wants you in the family business. But the priority is, are you looking at mercy? Is your home right? Are you constantly going to the table of the Lord and remembering what he's done for you so it, you don't get pricked with darts of legalism and judgment and bitterness and become a hypocrite in the house of God? Guard your heart, this is a, believe me what I say, if I can say this without sounding prideful, this is a powerful message about spiritual warfare. I'm telling you, if you'll take these principles and you'll apply them, you won't be walking in defeat. You won't walk in demonic oppression. You'll be able to drop your medication at one point because you'll say, Jesus is my medication. You'll have to stop, you'll stop paying that psychologist that you've been paying for the last 10 years that just feels like you're not going anywhere. You'll go, Jesus is my counselor, and the Holy Spirit is my Prozac, and all I need is what the blood did, and I'm good. Yeah. Amen? Hey. Let's close in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. You spoke and said it is finished, Lord. We believe it. We want to thank you, God, that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Father, we thank you for the blood of the lamb that covers this place right now, Lord. The doorpost of our hearts are anointed, God. Judgment has walked by, Lord, just passed over us. We pray, Father God, that you would help us as a people to not walk by sight, but walk by faith in what you've done and what you've done alone. 
Jesus, you are more than enough to satisfy us. So, Father, looking at your mercy, we choose to turn from worshiping our career, from worshiping flesh, from worshiping religion. Our allegiance, Jesus, is to you. You are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by you. We pray these things, Lord, because we believe them, because you've said them. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said? Amen. 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 Family, God bless you. We'll see you in the morning.